a, a few years now. Um, and I figured if I'm going to come here, I need to do something provocative. And so uh, I'm going to kind of walk through the question of whether the concept of efficiency is useless as, or, or useful as an explanation. Um, and um, I'm going to step back really far for a second and put my philosopher hat on and ask, what do we want out of explanations? So presumably, you know, when we do experiments, we're trying to come up with theories about how the world works, how the brain works, and those theories are really explanations. And so what do we want an ex what is, you know, explanation is one of the, the most fundamental parts of science alongside prediction and control, but most people, I think, think that the reason we do science is because we want to explain how the world works. So what is a good scientific explanation? Well, a good, scientific, a good scientific explanation probably tells us something about the mechanisms that are giving rise to the data that we've observed or collected, right? And um, one way you can think about that is it tells us, you know, let's make predictions about if we go, you know, wiggle something out in the world, what's going to happen? Is, is uh, you know, if we uh, cut off the gonads of a rat, is it going to change the way that it, uh, that it behaves in terms of rewards or something like that? So. Explanations let us make predictions. So with, with that sort of backdrop, I want to ask uh, a question about a hypothetical experiment. So let's say that um, we want to do an experiment about c cars and mileage. So we take two cars and drive each of them 100 miles. Uh, the Prius uh, takes two gallons to drive that 100 miles. The Porsche takes four gallons to drive that same 100 miles. So I, uh, you know, as an experimenter, I want to come up with an explanation of why does one car require more gas than the other? So one kind of explanation I could come up with is something like this. So, and uh, it's, uh, well, it has a, the Prius has a gas hybrid electric engine, and so it uses surplus engine power to generate electricity, which gets fed back. Uh, into drive power. It also has regenerative braking, which, which takes energy that would have been lost as heat and turns it back into electricity, which can be turned back into drive power. That's sort of an explanation that, uh, that most of us might think is a reasonable explanation, right? We could also say, well, it's because it's more efficient. That's why it takes less, uh, less gas to drive those, those uh, 100 miles. Um, and I think most of you would agree that that's not a particularly satisfying explanation of the difference between the Porsche and the Prius, right? Um, why is that? Well, let's think about what kind of experiments those two explanations tell you how to do, right? So if we, if we draw this sort of causal diagram of the, the, um, the first explanation, it basically says there's two factors that are feeding into mileage. One is the electric motor, the other is regenerative braking. That immediately tells us two experiments we can go do. We can unplug the motor, and presumably mileage will go up, uh, will go down. We can also unplug the brakes. Okay, so now we have three experiments, and we've tested our theory of hybrid mileage. Um, it's really unclear what the experiment is that you could go do to test this. It's not as if there's an efficiency module under the hood that you can unplug. It's, uh, it's not clear what, sort of what mechanistically that particular, using that word is telling us. And I want to make the argument that in general, in cognitive neuroscience, when people use the term efficiency, that it's not an explanation that it's really just renaming a phenomenon. And generally, for in imaging, it's renaming the phenomenon of reduced activation. So whenever people see reduced activation for one group for another, compared to another, they'll often say, well, that's because the group with less activation is more efficient. Okay, It's just another name for that. So it doesn't really tell us any more than if you just said it's reduced a uh, activation. Um, no, one of the first places that this sort of came out was in what's come to be called the neural efficiency theory of intelligence um, from Hare and his colleagues. So here's a, a quote from one of their papers. A series of investigations in normal subjects indicate an inverse relationship between brain glucose metabolic rate and psychometric measures of intelligence. These studies have been interpreted as evidence for a brain efficiency model of intelligence. Intelligence is not a function of how hard the brain works, but rather how efficiently it works. It's clear that that model is not a theory at all, right? It's just a redescription of the data um, that have been found. It doesn't really tell you anything more about intelligence than you knew when you saw the data. Um, and if you look across the cognitive neuroscience literature, this is just a selected few bits of text from various papers where people will use the term efficiency sort of as an explanation, right? So here's one, uh, the, the, the last one. We interpret this difference as a correlate of a gain in neural efficiency. Um, 
or uh, you know, think, uh, lower activation is a marker of neural efficiency, which is really just saying lower activation is a marker of lower activation. Right? They don't, it's not telling you anything more, um, I think. Um, but so the, the question I want to ask, so I've, I've given you the punchline of my talk, right? I could just sit down now. Um, but what I want to do is ask, what if, what if there really are differences in efficiency? What would that mean and how would we understand them? And what do we need to know if we're going to understand them? Um, and I think that hopefully there's, there's something interesting to be gotten out of this. I didn't want to just get up and, and be negative. Um, and, and so the, the rest of the talk is really fleshing out this idea. So what we mean by efficiency really is less energy, metabolic energy in the end, which we can see with BOLD or FTG or whatever, for the same neural computation, right? So the, you're doing the same thing, but you're using less energy to do it. That's what I mean by efficiency. So I've put together kind of a decision tree for how would we go about establishing if we're really seeing differences in efficiency as opposed to something else. So start up at the top left. Um, the first question is, is the same computation getting done? So if the, if the Prius drives on the freeway and the Porsche uh, drives on a dirt road next to the freeway, they've both driven 100 miles, but they didn't really do the same thing, right? So we couldn't really establish that one is more efficient than the other in that case. Um, so if it's not the same computation, then we can't conclude any differences in efficiency. Second, do they spend the same amount of time doing it? Right? So if, if, and I'm going to show you why this is really important, but the, but the punchline is basically if, if you haven't controlled for differences in time on task, you can't conclude anything about efficiency of the underlying process. Third is, is it the same neural firing rate? And that's a, a much harder thing for most of the people in this room, except for the people who work in, uh, in animal models, to get at. But I think it's important to, to realize, and we'll, we'll look at some, some recent data that, uh, that suggests that, that you can see differences in sort of the, the degree of energy used in the face of, of sort of a lack of changes in neuronal firing. But it, that's important to, to, uh, to rule out as well. Finally, if you show all those things are true, then you can potentially conclude that there's a difference in efficiency, where efficiency has to do with the amount of energy used to do some particular computation. So the first point I want to make uh, has to do with time on task. Um, and um, I don't know how many people in this, in this room routinely model reaction time as part of your fMRI models. I hope that the one thing you'll walk away from this with is that you really need to model reaction time in your, in your fMRI models. Um, and the point here is that the, the effects of, of sort of intensity of neural activity and time on task are, in fMRI data are basically indistinguishable. So here's a, a sort of a theoretical response. This is an impulse of size 0.2, and it gives you this sort of canonical hemodynamic response. So we can make an impulse that's twice as big, and we get a, a hemodynamic response that is roughly twice as big as well. What happens if instead of making it twice as intense, we just make it twice as long? So we take that 0.2 thing and just make it twice as long. Well, it turns out that you get a response that's almost indistinguishable and with a little bit of noise basically would be indistinguishable from what you get for twice, uh, twice the intensity. So for, for the most part, it's really hard to pull apart the effects of time and intensity in fMRI. So you could be seeing something that lasts twice as long or twice as high, and you're going to sort of confuse those two unless you've gone about modeling things in the right way. Um, there's a nice paper by Tal Yarconi a few years ago that looked across five studies of very different tasks and separately modeled reaction time effects from sort of overall task effects and saw that across these tasks there's a set of regions that always showed modulation by reaction time. And I think this is a great quote. If two experimental conditions differ substantially in mean RT, a corresponding difference in frontal activation is likely to be observed irrespective of any other differences in task structure. So you could have differences in RT and think, oh, you know, we found uh, differences in prefrontal activation relative to some particular interesting thing in our task. Could just be reaction time. Um, and so this also points to the real need to model reaction times. The, the thing that sucks about modeling reaction times is you often lose interesting stuff. The question is whether you want to be misinterpreting that interesting stuff uh, as uh, real task-related stuff when it could be RT-related. <laughs> so one question is, how do you model RT? And there's been some sort of interesting uh, discussion in the literature lately. Um, so let's say we have four trials with, with uh, different RTs, 200, 300, 500, 600 milliseconds. And this is what the associated hemodynamic responses would look like. The longer the reaction time, 
assuming that the neural function lasted as long as the reaction time, the, the longer, the, the bigger the hemodynamic response. Okay, now one way you can go about modeling that is by simply building an fMRI model that's modulated by reaction time. And this is the thing that Grinband et al. suggested in their 2008 paper. And what they showed is that for regions in the brain whose activity is modulated by reaction time, that moves with reaction time, you'll be more sensitive to finding activation in those areas. Turns out that if you have regions of the brain whose activity isn't modulated by reaction time, you're going to actually decrease your sensitivity to those areas and potentially bias your parameter estimates, um, especially if, you're, if the RTs differ across subjects. Um, in addition, you can't separate out reaction time effects from task effects. So I think that actually this is a, a bad way to go about modeling reaction time. That a better way to do is to use separate regressors for task activation. So that's the red one here that's kind of the, you know, the mean reaction time. And then this other one that models parametric uh, variance in the reaction time. So this lets you both get rid of the effects of reaction time, because you're modeling them in that RT regressor, but you can also retain the sensitivity to, um, to constant effects. And it lets you see which brain areas show RT effects, which ones show task effects. Um, so I think that this is actually a better way to go about modeling RT. All right, so let's say that we've made it that far through the, um, through the flow chart. Um, and now we want to ask, how might a brain become more efficient? And so I, I, there's probably more than these three ways that you can imagine a brain becoming more efficient. But the three ways that I thought of are metabolic efficiency, what we might call coding efficiency, which is changes in the neuronal code for the same neural computation, and network efficiency, which is sort of com efficiency of communication across the brain. So a bunch of work has been done trying to understand what's called the metabolic budget of brain activity. And one interesting thing that comes out of this is it turns out that spiking takes up a relatively small part of that budget. And this, is, this has only actually been sort of realized in the last few years based on some, some recent work that's uh, updated the, the older work on sort of how much energy goes into an action potential, particularly in, in the mammalian brain. Um, a lot of it's taken up by housekeeping, a lot of it's taken up by synaptic transmission, sort of dealing with, <laughs> dealing with transmitters. Um, but we might ask nonetheless, could you imagine changes in the efficiency of action potentials with development, say, or with learning? Um, so the efficiency of an action potential depends largely on the overlap of the sodium and potassium conductances that happen in time during an action potential. And the first thing to note is that across different types of neurons, the efficiency varies amazingly, right? So this is the squid axon in which all the early work was done, which turns out to be terribly inefficient. Um, a mouse thalamocortical relay neuron turns out to be pretty highly efficient. Um, another interesting thing is that a neurons differ across the different parts of the neuron in their efficiency. So this, this Hallerman paper showed that if you look at those different conductances over the different parts of the neuron, for example, between the dendrite and the soma and the node, they look very different. Um, so you could imagine that um, if across development neurons are changing in their morphology, um, you could have differences in the metabolic efficiency of action potentials coming about because the net is going to be kind of be, you know, putting together all this stuff coming about to do that. Now, I've, if anybody in here knows of work that's looked at developmental changes in this stuff, particularly in the mammalian brain, I'd love to hear about it, because I have not been able to find any. I found, found a little bit of stuff in brain stem and in other, other organisms. But, um, but I think that, that there's not much known, it seems to me, on how this kind of neuro, uh, neurometabolic efficiency changes with development. Now, some, a, a cool paper from uh, Peter Strick's group just came out, which sort of did what it took to actually establish differences in efficiency. So they trained these monkeys for something like 10 years on this particular motor task. And then they looked at both uh, neuronal activity and uh, meta metabolism using uh, 2DG um, for that task compared to an untrained task. And what's cool is that they show that there's in, uh, in particular parts of the brain that are responsive to the task, there's not really any differences in neuronal firing, that's the x-axis here, but big differences in uh, 2DG uptake. So you basically get this difference in efficiency, Low, less energy used for pretty much the same amount of spiking. Um, and so this shows that, it, that, one, that there probably are differences in efficiency related to both learning and development, 
two, that they're really hard to get at because you have to really show that the neuronal firing hasn't changed, but the, um, but the metabolic activity has. Um, another way you might imagine uh, efficiency changing is in is in coding, right? That you know, it's long been thought that um, coding, the efficiency of neuronal coding, has to do with the sort of the redundancy of that coding. This comes from Barlow's early efficient coding ideas, which has sort of suggested to a lot of people that efficient codes are sparse codes, where relatively few neurons respond to any particular stimulus. Um, it's been studied uh, sort of whether sparseness changes with the development. There's not a lot of work on this, but it turns out that at least in the ferret visual cortex, sparseness actually goes down rather than up with development. This is a work from a couple years ago from Pfizer's group. Um, so I think that, again, there's probably more work needs to be done in other parts of the brain, other systems, to try to understand how neuronal coding to do the same function changes uh, with development. Um, and finally, just quickly, because I'm almost out of time, um, one might imagine that the efficiency of network communication changes, even if you know, what each region is doing isn't changing, the way they talk to each other might change. One way that this has been um, defined is in terms of what's called network efficiency, which is if you take a, a, a graph, a network, and say, what's the average path length, the average distance I have to go to get from one node to another, um, that uh, that's some measure of kind of communication efficiency. Um, early work by Ed Bulmore and Sophia Shard show that this differs between healthy older adults and younger adults. Um, there's been conflicting developmental results. Some recent work suggested that at least one kind of local efficiency might be changing over time. That's this Wu et al. paper. But other earlier work had suggested no differences in global efficiency between children and adults. Um, one question is given that we know the, the impact that motion can have on a lot of these measures. As far as I can tell, none of this work used the kind of more advanced motion correction techniques that are probably necessary to really believe those things. So I think that it's an open question as to how these network measures change. So uh, to conclude, I hope I've convinced you that the term efficiency um, is, uh, is when it's generally used in, the, in, in this literature, um, is really just a renaming of the phenomenon of reduced activation, it's not telling you any more than the data told you itself. Um, and that bef if you really want to understand efficiency, um, that you have to rule out a lot of other uh, potential uh, sort of alternative explanations. And that um, there's a lot of sort of fundamental questions about uh, neurometabolism and neuronal coding and how they change over development, that if we want to try to make claims about differences in, uh, in imaging signals across development, there's, we really need a lot more work in animal models to try to help understand those kind of questions. Um, and thank you.